Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be meeting, if I'm going to be here for a lab this afternoon, um, given that I think when I left the house this morning, Dash was still probably going to go to school, but who knows how long it'll last. He's still got pretty nasty talk, so he'll probably be sent home at some point this morning. Um, so what I figured we would do, since we're in between chapters anyway, and this this week's lab requires quite a substantial lecture is just do that lab lecture right now and then it's a purely theoretical lab um well paper based lab anyway it's real data um and then uh, and you can either i'll be here through my office hours anyways the plan because i have to open up because carl's kids are also sick um right now and they're waiting on COVID tests. So I'm covering Carl's lab this morning anyway, immediately following this. So you're welcome to come over there, do your melting points from last week, um, work on this while the Gen Chem students are working on their projects or whatever else, or feel free to do whatever you normally do between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. on, on Tuesdays. Um, so we're just gonna, we're gonna go over how to interpret these these 2D NMR spectra, um, and these are these are not my slides. This is actually um, so fun fact. You can actually do research um, in chemistry on. There's actually specific journals um, for chemical chemical pedagogy. That's actually not a bad idea. I have. Uh, I actually have some right here. Um, since since I might be a vector at this point, you should probably yeah. put one of these on. So, uh, Chris said, well, no, that's the negative, but we yeah. should be talking about the most like, oh, like no. me and our rabbit. Um, so. It's uh, not a bad idea. So, given the cases are on the rise again and all that, but. Um, anyway, so this is actually this actually came from a paper that was written in the Journal of Chemical Education. You can actually get a chemistry PhD in chemistry pedagogy, or you know, the science of how people learn chemistry specifically. Um, so this this paper is, and these spectra are not mine, um, but uh, we're going to go through them. And, and discuss this, and you get a chance to see what other other chemistry instructors um, stuff or slides and, and things look like. Um, all right, so the way that 2D NMR works is you, you basically get a three-dimensional plot by measuring chemical shift in two dimensions. And then remember that NMR in general, it gave us um, spectra that looked like this, where we had chemical shift on the x-axis, and then we just had intensity that didn't really have any units to it, where the integral of the intensity birth, um, as a function of chemical shift was proportional to the hydrogens. Um, if it was a proton NMR, and actually jumps to a, that's a carbon NMR, there's your proton NMR. So just a quick recap of proton NMR since it's been a month or so since we thought about this. Um, <clears throat> the main pieces of information we get from proton NMR, um, every, the number of signals tells us the number of distinct hydrogens that we have. The chemical shift or how far they are left or right tells us how shielded they are. So more to the, if you go further to the left, more downfield, that means um, more de-shielded. And then the integration, so the area under the curve as a function of um, chemical shift tells us how many protons, um, more or less, is proportional to the number of protons. So at the very least, it will give you um you can get the you know for the sort of the empirical formula to use the term we used back in gen chem 
And then the peak splitting tells us about the number of protons next door or attached to the adjacent carbon. And this is really the key when it comes to the 2D NMR. We're actually going to use the reason that the peak splitting occurs is because those protons that are that are close enough chemically, um, basically they can interact with the energy, with the energies, and you actually wind up with a couple different wave energy levels for these for these nucleons to be pointing. Um, I say you could have them spin up and have them coherent, have all their spin pointing in the same direction, or you could have them um, decoherent. Um, is that the right word? That sounds wrong in my head. I think decoherent is the word, right? Incoherent, thank you. Um, you can have an incoherent, meaning that they're pointing in opposite space, and that's going to give you a different energy level. And so that's what creates these peak splitting. And so what 2D NMR does is it basically says, well, if we measure this carefully, we can, um, and they usually present both of the, there's my little, there. It's usually presented with the proton NMR as along the two axes. And for the same compound, those are going to be the same, but it gives you a frame of reference for what the chemical shift is for specific protons or specific signals. Um, what you get when you plot these against each other, and it's really, it's a little bit more complicated than that because what happens is, so here's a, a schematic representation of a 1D NMR where you wind up, you, you let your sample come to a ground state, everything kind of randomly, um, randomly arranged, then you put it in a magnetic field and let everything align to that magnetic field. And then you pulse it with light, you shine light on it, and you see what light is observed or how much light is given off when it, when it flips and becomes incoherent again. With 2D NMR, you basically just do that twice. And you have this relax, not relaxation time, you wind up with this T1 time in between the two pulses. And if you time that right, you wind up with two signals sort of on top of each other which doesn't sound like it'd be all that helpful, except for the fact that we can do a Fourier transform. So in a Fourier transform, is just a way of taking a group of waves that are all interfering with each other and turning it into individual waves. So for instance, if you had a wave that looked like this and you had a wave that looked like this, when you put them together, you might get something that looks like It's like a much more complicated wave that still looks more or less periodic. We can't do much with, with the combined form except that a Fourier transform is a mathematical procedure using matrices that allows us to take that combined wave and turn it into separated waves. And so when we get this combined figure, we get a 2D NMR where that basically tells us where protons are that are interacting with each other. Or we can do this actually with the carbon NMR on one axis and the proton NMR on the other axis. And you can see what protons go with what carbons, with what proton signals directly go with what carbons. So it kind of eliminates some of the guesswork between, okay, well, I'm pretty sure this hydrogen signal has to go with that carbon signal. If you remember doing that with carbon NMR, 2D NMR takes that guesswork away. It explicitly tells you these are the hydrogens that go with that carbon signal. It just is a little trickier to interpret until you know what you're looking at. Um, and so they they have two in this just breaking down what the, the signals look like again. Sorry, I have some schmutz on the thing. I wasn't sure if that was a noise on that spectra or not. Um, so in, you basically have uh, both of the, the simplest kind puts the two proton NMRs against each other. 
essentially. So as your x-axis and your y-axis, you have um, your proton NMR. And, but if you take that and then you look at the, I'm going backwards. At, at uh, what happens when you do that pulse time one, pulse two, and time two, if you just look at the diagonal here, if you just look along the diagonal, you should get essentially the 1D NMR because that's when you have the signals interacting with itself. But anything that shows up off of the diagonal is interesting because that means that those signals, you have things interacting with other protons. So everything along that diagonal red line is telling is telling you that's the proton signal interacting with itself. So it's not really anything more interesting than the regular proton NMRs. And just a recap, just um, this is what's called um, correlation spectroscopy, which they call COSY, because we like our nice, our nice fun acronyms to spell things. Um, but as you can see, they're picking and choosing the letters, but it's common enough name now, COSY um, NMR, that um, that it still shows up everywhere. And the interesting thing about this is it doesn't really require, and just like a carbon NMR, doesn't require a new machine. If you can take a proton NMR and you can tune what wavelength, what chemical shift you're looking at, you can also take a carbon NMR. And if you can do that, you can also take a cozy NMR. Right, so this is basically using the same tools we already have, which is good because these NMR costs like 50 grand um, on the low end. That's that's the, the cheap version. The really nice helium cooled NMRs will go upwards of, of a quarter million. Um, so being able to get as many types of NMR and as much information as possible out of the same really expensive instrument is really important, um, especially when you're writing grants, right? And trying to convince the university to pay for something or um, that uh, convince the NIH that you really need this because you're doing really, really groundbreaking work. You need to be able to say, but wait, there's more. Um, right, exactly. Um, so these, these samples or these signals that are off of the diagonal effectively tell us that the proton responsible for this signal is also interacting with the proton responsible for that signal. So effectively, in, in generally speaking, the easiest way to, to interpret this is to say, okay, well, those two signals must be physically close together on the molecule in order for this to happen. So it's really actually a pretty straightforward to interpret once you know what you're looking at. I guess I can't say that. It's telling you fairly straightforward information once you get practice at, at interpreting these. Because if you already looked at the NMR, the regular proton NMR, and you already have an idea of what your possible molecules are, but maybe you think, oh, okay, well, I'm not sure between these two structures, which it is, which signal goes with which protons. This really is the nail in the coffin there because it allows you to say, okay, I know signal A is interacting with signal B. Therefore, they're close together. So let's consider this molecule here. So this is dimethyldiamine, N N N N prime dimethyldiamine. No, N N dimethyl ethylene diamine. There's probably some more locates in there saying both. So N N prime dimethyl one two ethylene diene. Um, if we're just looking at the proton NMR here, we can 
you can tell a fair bit about this structure. Um, for instance, we know that that the 1.5, so we, we have a couple of options here, really, right? We have CH3s that are identical. We have CH2s that are identical. And we have the nitrogen hydrogen. We should be able to to figure out which is which is which here, potentially just based on the on the splitting, or sorry, based on the um, integration. Except that nitrogen makes things a little bit weird there, and so this just has the chemical shift label here. All right, so. This 1.5 number is probably corresponds to A. Makes sense as the highest integration. We have the most there. The broadest peak, a lot of times, if you have something like an, an OH group or if you have a nitrogen with hydrogen on it, that's going to show up a little broader of a peak because you wind up with a lot of, of intermolecular attraction between these. So just like an OH and an IR shows up as being a really wide signal, you have some, you can see similar things in the NMR. It's a little less common in the NMR. Um, it depends on the concentration of the sample and things like that. Um, and frankly, what the solvent is. And then we had C, it's our sample right there. It's gonna be the, the CH2 in between. So this, if, we're, if we believe what this is telling us, then that actually is interesting because it means that our integration can't really be trusted in this case, which is not necessarily, it's always something to be wary of, especially when you've got atoms that aren't carbon, right? Because remember we had that issue with OHs, hydrogens that were attached to an oxygen sometimes didn't show up with any splitting. They would show up as a signal, but couldn't be trusted with their splitting and couldn't be trusted with their, their integration as well. Um, so the fact that A and C, their integration agrees fairly well. Um, and it's not going to be a perfect answer. These are This is real data, so it's not, not exact integers. But you can say if it's a 1 to a 1.5, that's pretty close to a two to three ratio, right? Even if it's a little bit off in the sig figs. When we look at the cozy spectra here, we can see that C interacts with itself. We can see that A interacts with itself. And we can tell that that's interacting with itself because it's right on the diagonal as we draw the line here. And when we drop down the vertical and the horizontal lines, we see that um, our horizontal line from A runs into the vertical line from A right at that signal. So this cozy spectrum is not particularly useful because those the heteroatoms there, the nitrogen kind of throws off a couple of so, but that is one way we could we could definitively say, okay, well, B signal B must definitely be the nitrogen because you're not seeing these this coupling happening that you're supposed to. We don't even see B coupling with itself. We should see a signal right there, right? But because it's a nitrogen, that that actually tells us that that little signal is the nitrogen. The fact that it's not coupling with itself. If we look at a slightly more interesting case, so same same formula. So this would be NN dimethyl 1,2-ethylene diamine. So we put both methyls on the same group. Now all of a sudden, this nitrogen doesn't have any hydrogens. And these two are chemically distinct from each other. 
So we now all of a sudden we still have now we have what's the the methyl groups with both of the CH two that's three distinct hydrogens plus the hydrogens on the amine at the far end. So that gives, should give us four signals. And I believe that's just the same signal zoomed in. So just to show that they, they had it zoomed out just to show that there's really nothing there. See, that's the same peak that we had before. Um, on the, the last one, there was a bigger peak there that wasn't labeled right at the same chemical shift. Almost certainly that's leftover solvent or it's the solvent that, that our sample is dissolved in. In fact, it's not labeled and doesn't correspond to anything we would expect to see from this molecule. It tells us that, that we can basically ignore that. And it's one of those things that if you spent your, if you did a lot of research in this area, you would get to recognize your common impurities because they always show up at the same chemical shift. So as soon as you see that it shows up at seven point whatever, in fact, based on where it's showing up, maybe this is in benzene. Benzene might be the solvent in this case. That's aromatic region, right? But it's only one signal. And so benzene only has one hydrogen, chemically distinct hydrogen. So I would guess that that's either leftover benzene um, from something about the synthesis process or it's dissolved in that as a solvent. And you see that same peak there, it's smaller, but there's still some benzene in that sample. Um, so then take that and basically say, okay, well, there's nothing interesting above three. So let's zoom in from one, from zero to three so that we can see the splitting better. So it's the same spectrum. And once again, down here, we have a, a small wide peak with no splitting. That's our nitrogen. It's just like we saw before, right? Which means these other ones, so it's a little bit tricky to, to assign, which we can, we can take a guess. If we're trying to assign um, which, which of these triplets goes with B versus C, what would we, what would we guess? What's the only difference between them? Shielding. The shielding, which should be more shielded based on electron donating or electron withdrawing. We would expect C to be more shielded because we have these methyl groups, right? They're both directly attached to a nitrogen, but methyl groups are electron donating. So that nitrogen should have a little bit more electron density, which means at the same time, C should have a little bit more electron density. So we would expect that to be C and this to be B. And that is in fact, what they have them labeled as. So if we can, this is not a particularly tricky example, right? It's a fairly simple molecule. We can, we can just use the proton NMR. But so this is more of a, of a way of establishing which is which. And then we can use that to practice interpreting the cozy NMR. And then the methyls should have the highest integration. There are two methyls. Um, so that's a total of six protons and they're the most shielded because metals are always the most shielded. And now when we look at the cozy NMR and drop that di diagonal line in there, we see some interesting signals happening here. I'm not sure why I'm drawing that by hand. Um, effectively, and so this is just a, a point of reference, since this, this is 2D NMR and this, the 1D NMR is what should show up on the diagonal, you're going to wind up with the, with the peaks being symmetrical 
on both sides. You only really need to interpret one side of the diagonal. It's not important to do both sides of the diagonal because whatever is on this side is the same as what's on the other side. So effectively, if B is coupled with C, then C is also coupled with B. Not a whole lot to interpret there. Right, so this the same the same section zoomed in right around this area. So once we know there's nothing else that we're really interested in, we might as well zoom in so we can see some details. And we do in fact see that C and B are coupled. B is coupled with itself, C is coupled with itself, D is coupled with itself. No surprises. B being coupled with C tells us that they're physically close together, like we expected. Again, no surprises in this case with this simple molecule. But this really gets to be helpful, especially when we start looking at substitution on aromatic rings. Because we can effectively say, okay, well, it has to be this isomer because this is the only isomer that has peak A close enough to peak B to couple. Right, so it, it basically gives you that smoking gun in terms of, well, I, I'm not just guessing this is the isomer. All right, so I'm down to two options and I'm pretty sure it's this one, but maybe it's the other one. It eliminates that effectively. And so, does the number and shape of the dots have any Um, not, not really. And it's you, you can't interpret it too easily. So, let's look at Let's just keep making more extreme molecules here. Not extreme, extreme, but um, in terms of being able to see what's going on here. So it's the same molecule we just had, we just added an extra CH2 in the middle. So that should give us some extra signals, right? We now have five sig proton signals. And we should be able to would expect, we label these A, B, C, B, E. We should expect that B is correlated with C, D is correlated with C, and C should be correlated, conversely, should, C should be correlated with both of them. So this makes it really easy. We don't have to do any guesswork with shielding and what's going to be most shielded or be shielded, because the second we can. And again, the splitting answers this one for us, really, right? Because we know that that has to be C, the one that's right in the middle, just based on the splitting. Just like we know that based on the splitting, that has to be the methyls, and these two have to be B and B. And we could make we could make the same assumption we did before and say, okay, well, this is B and this is D. So again, no surprises. And when we look at the two at the cozy NMR, now all of a sudden we have two signals off of the diagonal. And if we already have some idea of what the proton NMR looks like, it could be helpful to, to go through and label and say, at least the ones that you know. Right, because this can be a process of elimination. In this case, we don't need the cozy. We could have just done it looking at the regular proton NMR. That's not always the case. A lot of times we'll have peaks labeled as like, well, B comma D. It's one of these two. I'm not sure which yet. And so it's going to be a matter of going back and forth. It's almost like a Sudoku puzzle where you're trying to, okay, here are my options. And as you go through and look at everything else, you're able to slowly cross things off until you're left with only one possibility.
<clears throat> so it's that same logic um, that we've seen before. So this is the zoomed in version of the same, same spectrum. And no surprise, we expected C to be correlated with B and D. Um, and like if you if you have a really high resolution 2D NMR and you're really careful about how you how you interpret it, sometimes you can get in there and see see the splitting. Like you can kind of see the the shape up here that looks like a a pentuplet, which is what C is, right? You, but it, you don't see the middle peak of the triplet from B in this case, right? So it's, it's one of those things where because of the way that these waves interact with each other, you can't trust the splitting in the cozy animal. It seems like you should be able to, and it seems like there's enough detail that you ought to be able to interpret that. But the waves just make that a little bit tricky because a triplet interacting with a pentuplet gives you a pentuplet doublet, not a pentuplet triplet. And so that it just is a little unreliable. And if you had access to the raw data and you wanted to take this and do another Fourier transform and break this up, you could in theory turn that into the actual splitting for both of them again. But since we already have this splitting in a way we're used to looking at it, there's not a whole lot of reason to, to go into that. Basically just use the cozy as a way to say peak C aligns with signal B or is correlated with. And based on the, on the way that your monitor's aspect ratio shows up or the way that the data is displayed, you get some really weird funky ones too. So don't, don't beat yourself up trying to interpret splitting, basically, is the main point there. All right, and so as we expected, C being in the middle, there are two signals in, I guess we can call this row C with the, with the y-axis and also in column C, right? So this is a symmetrical matrix once we do the, the Fourier transform. Um, it's just not arranged top left to bottom right. It's arranged top right to bottom left. But that's just a matter of you know, historical reasons. NMR are displayed in this weird way from right to left instead of left to right. All right. So here's another example of another style of, of um, 2D NMR. So this is called HX, HSQC, heteronuclear single quantum coherence spectroscopy. It uses the same exact technique. The key is that first word, heteronuclear. So basically, if you time the delay in between the two pulses just right, and you change what parts per million you're looking for with your detector, you can measure the proton NMR on the, y, on the X axis and the carbon NMR on the Y axis. And now that that gives you some different information because it, it shows you which core, which carbons and protons are directly attached to each other. So for the HSQC, the diagonal doesn't mean anything anymore because we have a different we have a different scale on the x and the y axis. So we're not worried about that anymore. What we can do is we can look at these signals and and compare them and say, just the same way as we could say B is, is um, coupled with C, we can say that carbon A is correlated with proton A. Right, and so effectively what, what you get is the proton NMR spectrum and the carbon NMR spectrum on top of each other. All right, and so the this is the same molecule we looked at before. The carbon NMR for this molecule, we can go through here and assign the carbon NMR here. And this is this is likely 
um, the signal between 70 and 80 is probably also the, the benzene that was present before. Because we should only have two protons or two carbon signals here. So, but this is this is fairly common um, in in real data to not have it be perfect and to one have all this little noise at the bottom. That's impurities to some extent. And you can tell basically by the difference in the in the signal intensity. We can't integrate um, and get real answers, but anything that's present in small amounts will have much smaller signals. And so um, as long as your sample is relatively concentrated, you can say that anything down there in that area I circled is just impurities. Um, and once again, if you happen to know what your solvent is or what your common impurities are that show up in large concentrations, that allows you to basically ignore that one too. All right, and so we could we can go through here. We could say, okay, A and C are our only two options here. A should be more shielded because it's a methyl group. We would expect carbon A showing to show up at thirty six point six, and call and carbon C showing up at fifty one point five four. When you do the two D NMR. The actual exact numbers that show up should be the same. So that actually gives you a lot of ability having these peaks labeled. When we come back and look here, okay, well, these are our two signals. It was 51 and 36. So where's our, I guess this is two different things. That's not the same, same compound. Take it back. Don't compare to that one. Um, you guys remember looking at the DEPT? Where we cut this is one version. This is like a simplified 2D NMR. It's technically 2D NMR. Um, but the second dimension is basically just up or down. Right. So that makes it a lot easier to interpret because it basically just tells you if it's a CH or CH3, it's up. If it's a CH2, it's down. So that core that corresponds to what what we what we expected a and c showing up there and when we look at the hxqc this signal at at uh i guess the, i'm looking at the wrong one this Here's our 51, here's our 36. That right there tells you um, how to interpret the proton NMR. Because if we already looked at the carbon NMR, and we know that that's our methyl group. The fact that it's paired up with um, with signal A on the proton NMR tells us that those two go together. So if we had, if we were doing process of elimination, and let's say we had gone down to, okay, I'm not sure if A, if this this peak here is A versus B, but then I was able to interpret the carbon NMR and say, okay, well the peak that's at 36 is definitely A. That all of a sudden allows me to come in and look at the HSQC and say, okay, well, it's not A or B anymore. Now I know it's definitely A. Right? So you're never going to be looking at these 2D NMR in a vacuum. They're always in the context of other NMR information. So not, but none of them are a silver bullet on their own. Right? There are times where your proton NMR is most next to useless because all the signals are on top of each other or because you have so many that are so close together and you can't differentiate between them. There are times where your carbon NMR doesn't give you enough signals to tell what's going on. Maybe you have something where you don't have carbon or you have, um, you're interested in the proton signal that doesn't have a carbon, signal B. Carbon NMR is not all that useful for figuring that out, right? 
This is just additional information that allows us to tell what's paired with what. So if we look at the same more complicated sample here, where we put the two metals on the same nitrogen, we can look at the DEPT and say, okay, well, the two that are downward are my CH2s, my methylenes, and D is the methyl. This is a term that I never really used all that much. Um, you know the term methylene breaking? Yeah. It, to mean a CH2, right? What is the CH equivalent? It's methyl methylene, but it's not a methyl ion. It's like carbon. Maybe it's just a carbene. Yeah, that could be. Either way, it's well, like carbene is just C. Okay, so it'd be a quaternary carbon. Would be a carbene. That makes sense. Then like I'll look it up with break. I was just curious if you knew off the top of your head, because I don't, like I said, I don't use those terms that much. Um, so we know that these are the two that correspond with, with C and B. And we know that they're at 39 or at 40 and 63 for a chemical shift. And D is our methyls at 45, 46. Now we can come in here and say, okay, well, if right at 40 and right at 63, we can see how those interact with each other. And when we zoom in, we can see, okay, here is B interacting with B with 40. Here is C interacting with C. And here is D interacting with D. All right, so that's that's what it's gonna come down to is for this HSQC, it's basically just a way of assigning, once you know either the carbon or the hydrogen um, NMR, you can go through and assign the other one just as a one-to-one -one relationship between these. And you do see some noise showing up, like you can see these, this small signal there and this small signal there. Um, those aren't, you're not always able to, inter to uh, interpret those that much. And usually when you zoom in, um, those, are, those are effectively noise. So if you have two, if you're looking at HSQC and there's two signals for the same carbon, or two signals for the same hydrogen, go with the stronger of the two. Um, I mean, in, in theory, it should tell you that C and B are close to each other, um, but it's not always, it doesn't show up reliably, so you can't use it in a negative way, by which I mean you can't use it to rule things out. You can use it to support an idea, but, but its absence is not evidence that they're not close to each other, if that makes any sense. It goes with the, this is a case where it goes by the old, the old adage that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But if it's there, that's evidence that they're pretty, that they're close together, but you don't want to rely on that too much. And push comes to shove, go with the stronger signal. And when you zoom in and do a little bit of data analysis, you see a lot of times that those other signals just disappear. All right, let's look at the more complicated one again. So now we should see three showing up as being pointing downward on the DEPT. And again, this is probably enough on its own. 
for us to assign the carbon NMR. But at the very least, like it shows that, okay, if I can't decide out of these three, which is which, because B, C, and D should all be those, those three signals, right? If I'm not confident assigning those, but I can look at, I know I can look at the proton NMR and I say, okay, well, just looking at the splitting, I can tell C apart from the others, right? And so that's going to be a case where the, the HSQC is really helpful. Because if all I know about the carbon NMR is that E is this middle one, then, but I looked at the proton NMR and I was able to assign B, C, and D. Now all of a sudden that allows me to say, okay, well, that's definitely B. That's definitely D. This one is definitely C. All right, so there's the zoomed in version. All right, so that, that really puts puts it to rest there because the splitting made it really easy with the proton NMR. So if I wanted to assign something to the carbon NMR, then we just have to go to the HSQC and compare them. So with the uh, HSQC, so it's not like with the Posey where you're looking at what's close to each other, but you're looking at like what is the same. Exactly. Yeah, it's, a, it's you can think of HSQC as like a, a translation dictionary. It's a one-to-one. -one. As opposed to HMBC, which is heteronuclear multiple bond coherence spectroscopy. And now this shows correlations between protons and carbons that are two or three bonds apart. So this is a lot harder to interpret. HSQC is really easy to interpret once you know what you're looking at. HMBC is really sort of the last resort. Because it's going to give you a lot of possibilities, especially when you start looking at things like um, you know, benzene rings, where you can see coupling happening two or three bonds apart. And specifically, it doesn't show one bond. It's not up to three bonds apart. They show up in HMBC if they're coupled two bonds or three bonds. So all of your signals from HSQC don't show up. All of your signals for HSQC are gone in HMBC. So if we go back to our same N N prime dimethyl ethylene dimine, if we look at A and C, so in this one, A is showing up coupled with C, and C is showing up coupled with A. And C is also showing up coupled with itself, though, but I just said that that can't happen. So what's going on there? We're still, it'll show up as being coupled with itself if you have two carbons that are chemically identical that are right next to each other, right? Because if I count, so this hydrogen, one bond goes to the carbon it's directly attached to, that won't show up on HMBC, but two bonds away, it will. So it's showing up that carbon coupled with the hydrogen showing up in blue. And these with that carbon. So you can have them coupled with each other if 
they're two bonds away. And it's chemically the same compound. So as you can see, this gets really complicated to try and interpret these, right? Because you have to count bonds. Say, okay, well, should this show up in the HMBC or not? And you have to actually draw out the complete structure to be able to see that a lot of the time until you get used to it, like, because you need to count that first bond, hydrogen to carbon, and then carbon to the next atom. In fact, we should see some weirdness with the nitrogen too, although we're in the wrong, the wrong part of the, um, the wrong part of the chemical shift. Yeah, we don't really see anything with the nitrogen there. The nitrogen would be if we had any peaks right here. But nitrogen being a different molecular weight than carbon is going to show up at a different chemical shift. Soft that's off the, the scale of what was measured here. In theory, if we expand it, actually, no, we can't do that because nitrogen has an even number of protons plus nucleon or protons plus neutrons. So nitrogen won't show up here no matter what. Because you have remember, we have to have an odd number of nucleons for it to show up in an NMR. And nitrogen is mass of 14. Oxygen to mass of 16. All right, so here is the, the zoomed in version. So we should see a peak for, for A. We have, or so, yeah, for A. The methyl groups, we should have, okay, one, two to the nitrogen. Three gets us to the carbon, right? So A is coupled to C. The hydrogens on A are coupled to the carbon C. So hydrogens for A. Coupled with carbons with carbon C. Which we do in fact see a peak there. A should be coupled with itself because we have that one, two, and also coupled with carbon C. So we have proton C, hydrogen C here, should show up with two signals, and they should correspond to the the carbon signals that go with A and C. So this is another case where, where the number of signals tells you something interesting. Because if you can look at this, at this structure and say, okay, well, this hydrogen should have two signals because there are two carbons that you can get to that are either two bonds away or three bonds away. If they were on a benzene ring, you could potentially have Okay, there are four distinct carbons that you can get to that are either two bonds away or three bonds away. That allows you to sort of eliminate options. Say, okay, well, it can't be this structure or it can't be this hydrogen because this hydrogen should have three peaks, not four. Right, so it's, it's almost, a, it's, it's a way of breaking apart the molecule into pieces that you can wrap your head around to some extent, where with just the proton and mark, everything's piled into the same structure, into the same spectrum. And it can get really hard to, to break it apart and figure out what's what. HMBC is a way to break it apart, especially if you think about it in terms of columns and rows. All right, so here, this is for our dimethyl and n-dimethyl. 
So for this carbon or this hydrogen here, how many carbons are either two or three bonds away? There's one, two bonds gets to a nitrogen, that won't show up. One, two bonds gets to a carbon, that should show up. One, two, three bonds gets to another nitrogen, which won't show up. So this proton, proton B, should only have one signal in the carbon range. And it should be carbon C. These ones that have more possibilities are a little bit harder to interpret, but remember, you just take it one atom at a time with these. Think of it, don't look at this entire thing as one spectrum. Each column is, a, is its own set of information, and each row is its own set of information. Tackle it that way, as opposed to just, there's so many peaks there, I don't know what to do. So for this hydrogen, how many peaks should we see? So one bond gets to this carbon, that won't show up. Two bonds gets here. Three bonds gets to another nitrogen, that won't show up. So that should show up and this should show up. So carbons D and B should show up or proton C. So out of every, every atom that's two to three bonds away, we're just looking for what carbons are two to three bonds away from the hydrogen. Other hydrogens we ignore. That shows up in the cozy. Other of the nitrogens don't show up at all because they have an even number of uh, nucleons. So we should see two signals and that is what we see. And they do correspond to B and D. And anytime you wind up with a signal that doesn't have a signal on the corresponding um, NMR, you can, uh, that's almost certainly just noise. Don't try to interpret it. If it shows up as a signal, but there's nothing to match it with, don't read into that. When we start getting taking into account all the different possible ways these things can interact. Some of them are even more complicated, but they don't show up consistently enough for us to worry about interpreting them. All right, our last case here is for D, the hydrogens on D, and how many signals they should have. So for D, Remember, we're looking for two to three bonds away. So the atoms that are two to three bonds, the carbons that are two to three bonds away from protons on D, should be carbon B. So this, this is one that should bond with or should couple with itself. And then C. Which again is what we would expect. So 
this is definitely a case of this can give you a set of options. If you start by doing what we did down below and saying, counting, okay, I know that this proton is, is X. Therefore, anything that shows up in the HMVC is one of these three options. That allows you to look at your carbon NMR and, and nail down, okay, I don't know exactly which is which, but I know that this is either C or, C or D. And then when you add that, add in the fact that you've got all these other spectra as well, it's a lot of moving pieces to keep track of. You've got five spectra for every, for every compound you're looking at, but it gives you enough information that when you know what you're doing, you should be able to get to the right structure every time. Or if you have the structure, you should be able to assign the right um, peaks to the right carbons and hydrogens. Which is, which is what your assignment actually is. Your assignment is here are some compounds. Here are all the spectra that go along with them. What peak goes with what proton? What peak goes with what carbon? Right, so it's it's a little bit easier than trying to figure out the structure from nothing. Um, but it's good practice with this. And you can see how these get a little bit overwhelming. If you just see this is the raw data, right? Columns and rows, columns and rows. So if you just look at it this as that, if you ignore everything else, then it, regardless of what else is going on, we, we know right there, okay, well, B, proton B has two carbons that are either two or three bonds away. That's all it needs to tell you right there. And then you can get into it and say, okay, well, if it's column, if this is proton B, if I've already established that, then one, two, three, the nitrogen won't show up. We're looking at these two, carbons C and D have to be these two signals. And even if we can't distinguish which one is which yet, we know that that's D or it's C and C and D. And then you go and look label on your other charts. Hey, here are my possibilities. All right, so this is walking through this in more detail. So I think it's probably worth it to, we'll take our break here in a second. Um, but before we do, I just want to, to show you what the, the assignment looks like we can talk about the logic because again it can look a little overwhelming when you first see it um, and these are all on the they're posted on canvas um, and it's they're color coded if you go there I um, ran out of paper at home so I didn't actually print them in color for you if I wanted to um, but effectively what you're going to do is say, okay, for this molecule, you're given a proton NMR. And you have to say, okay, based on the integration, the chemical shift, these are the possibilities. And so it can be okay, well, if I'm looking at, at this, um, based on the chemical shift or the chemical shift and the Integration, sorry, C, we, we don't, or sorry, J, we don't, um, we haven't been using, so we don't really need to worry about J. Um, J is a coupling constant that has to do with how close the different um, peak splitting is and what the, there's, there's fine, it's referred to as fine structure details. Um, you can get really into that and that can give you a little bit more information. It's not as important as the stuff we're used to thinking about. So don't worry about J for now. Um, see it's J the ratio between the, 
height of the central peak and the height of the peak on either side of it, maybe. It's something, it's something, I'm sorry, I'm talking myself, I'm not asking you. Um, it's something that I never learned, like at all. I learned it when I taught this class the first time and it confused more people than it helped. Um, and it's not all that commonly used. So for the most part, we're gonna ignore it. Um, if you get really into NMR, then you will learn about J and you might find it more useful. You can always send me an email a couple of years from now. Like, hey, you really need to cover J more because we use it all the time. Um, I have not had that feedback yet. So we're going to not worry about J. But effectively, if you know what the chemical shift is, you know what the integration is, that's going to give you, okay, maybe it's A, B, or D are my options. Maybe you can't assign it more than that. Maybe this one you know for sure is C. So basically, you're just filling in what the options are, coupling constants. That's what J is. Um, and it's something about the, the either the difference in the height of the peaks or the dip, distance in between the peaks when you have peak splitting happening. Anyway. Um, so then, and again, you might not, you might not be able to say, are you stopped? Sorry, stop the screen sharing. What's going to happen? You might not be able to say just based on the proton anymore, what everything is. That's fine. Just leave it as the options because then the next thing is, okay, for the same molecule, here's the cozy. Now, what do you know? And then you can take what you have from up above and you refine it in the table down below until you get to a point where everything is labeled and with only one possibility. And so you can go back through here too when you start looking at the cozy. If you had A, B, or D were your options here, and then you looked at the cozy, you could say, okay, well, then I can definitely cross off B. And then that might change. So they, that can cause a cascading effect. They will, okay, if B can't be this one, then B must be this one, because that's the only other possibility for B. Right? So it's, a, it's an interactive process. It's not linear. It's back and forth as you're going. Right? So let's start with the simplest one, which is almost always a proton NMR, just to get a list of possibilities. And then start looking at the carbon NMR or the cozy NMR, et cetera. Are all the, NMRs the, the NMRs, I have them as a separate packet because you're going to need to be flipping back and forth and drawing on them and stuff like that. So here's your report sheet, and here's the, the spectra. There's 26 pages of spectra um, because you get a whole page spectra. I didn't want to condense it. You get a whole page spectra for all of these different possibilities. So one compound might have five pages of spectra. Um, so a lot of information clearly, hard to interpret because you can get a little bit of data overload. But this is your assignment for today for lab. Um, and we can just we'll take we'll take our break now, but it's be 9:20 when we come back, and we're just going to be working on this. Um, so we can either work on it here. Like I said, I have to open up the lab at 10. Um, the lab's not all that comfortable to work in. You're welcome to work in my office while I'm in the lab or go over there if you want to work on it um, or go to the library. Either way, but we can go ahead and adjourn class at this point. Um, and just know I will be over in the chem lab or in my office until, until at least 1130. Um, and if I get a chance, I'll try and stop by the lab, library on my way out. But no guarantees since I might be running out fast to pick up a sip here. Uh, good to see you guys now. I uh, am new to the senior day. That's, uh, oh, that's today, huh? I, I am also supposed to help out with senior day. Um, I've forgotten about that, and then I volunteered to help Carl. So I'm going to go check in with them and tell them. So you're welcome to to um, hang out at the STEM table and talk up chemistry, um, since I have to be over in the lab. 
Yes, I'm the only uh, representative of the path. So it's a it was not a great time to schedule it really. Yeah. There was not enough coordination there, I don't think. Yeah, I got an email like really last minute from uh, Austin Jarwin. It's like this is a required event 